God damn it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, man. Hey, Jason, how's hey, it how's going? It? Good. You know, I'm yeah. just gonna I'm gonna jump into an intro and just so we can just get rocking with this. Okay. Um, so, hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Face the Truth. Um, I'm gonna I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna be straight up. I am feeling weird right now. I had a strange allergic reaction this morning. Oh no. Um, uh, and I've been feeling like just I'm not there all the way. And I had I took some Benadryl, so I'm a little ugh, right now. Uh, but I'm feeling a little bit better. But um, it's been a, a crazy couple of days. My my one year old had a high fever, of like a 105. Mm. So it's been a rough day. Uh, couple days in the uh, the uh, Siler household. No, not COVID, which is good. Um, uh, I don't think so. Anyways, we're, 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 we haven't gotten to test back yet, but they're pretty sure that's not what it is. But anyways, lots going on. Uh, I just want to let everyone you know um, my guest from last week, uh, or the, the guest that was supposed to be from last week. Uh, we had to postpone because of some personal things that happened in his life. Uh, but no worries. We're going to be talking with him soon, uh, Wes Hutchinson. But I've got an awesome guest this week. Um, I've known Dan uh, for years, uh, just uh, through um, uh, originally the NCN and then now uh, ISCA, the caricature organization. Um, super uh, fun guy, talented guy. And the thing, one of the reasons why I wanted to have him on the podcast was because not only um, is he an artist, uh, a living artist, and um, a cool guy, but he's also an entertainer, which I find um, a great combination of, you know, he, he, he's come up with a real creative way to show his art in an entertaining way, um, and it's really fun to watch. And also, he's, he's gotten to branch out and, and do, you know, tons of different media, different things to show people what it can do with his art. So I want to talk to him about that and, and how it got started and all that kind of stuff. And um, also, he's, he's really weird to look at. And I, I think that's great for YouTube. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure this is going to be so much fun having a look at this guy for this podcast. I'm telling you. Anyways, everybody, welcome, please. The one and only Dan Dunn. Like a Muppet cheer, you know, the yeah. Muppets. Ah! Yeah, so the good guy couldn't come. So you're stuck said, with me this week. So sorry. <laughs> oh, you no, know, no. Was... No, actually, he was supposed to be last week. Um, so I took a week off because, uh, yeah, it, he unfortunately, some some not so good things happened in his life. But uh, mm. we, he will have him on and we'll talk about whatever he feels comfortable talking about. Um, he's a great guy. He was he's a guitar player with Nora Jones and a bunch of amazing oh. bands. And he's a a producer and a, mu a musician and a writer and so but we'll have him on soon so but my, we got my you manager, dan <laughs> my manager uh used to be with the agency that represented nora mm. with feldman and associates oh that's cool Vancouver. yeah that's awesome yeah i'm name dropping already yeah. and i haven't even gotten started <laughs> yeah i i um i got to hang out with her a few summers back um oh that must uh, have been cool so uh, one of my friends uh is Corey chisel he's an amazing musician singer songwriter and um, she took him on uh, tour with 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 them, and so a cocaine, um, yeah, yeah. cocaine. <laughs> so we got to uh, uh, hang out with her and stuff, and it was really cool because there was. Uh, I'll tell this story when Wes goes on, but but basically they, we did some surprise shows where no, they they didn't say it was Nora Jones. People had no idea she was just on stage the entire right. show playing piano, and no one. She wasn't really singing all that much. She was playing with my friend's band. So this whole crowd, they have no idea Nora Jones is right. They're not even, they don't get it. You know, it was pretty cool. But anyways, how have you been, man? Besides the cocaine problem. Uh, besides the cocaine, I can't yeah. get enough cocaine. Um, no, I've, uh, um, I've been doing real well. Uh, you know, COVID was really rough for us. And so I did some carpentry for a while and flipped a house that I owned, which gave us enough money to get through. And uh, my son's been in the studio every day doing paint jam and 
And uh, we don't have the last few months, we we're starting to get enough bookings to where it makes sense to keep the doors open, but it's, it's to that point for us. But uh, I just, I, I'm excited about the directions. I'm starting to uh, get into my fine art again, which I really haven't done that since college. I mean, mm. to just th come up with the idea of saying, Hey, what do you want to paint? I don't know, Dan, yeah. what do you want to paint? Yeah, let's paint that <laughs> without, because everything I've ever done has been commercial art or caricatures or something where I had to fulfill something for someone else. Yeah. And when it was art, I was just trying to make good art. And uh, I had, that was, that was, wonderful so i'm gonna i'm gonna see if i can sell that which is like the hardest thing in the world i can imagine to do but, is it hard is it hard to slow down a little bit <laughs> oh my god so that's so funny like... that is such a funny question it, it's been better it's been better now because i've had two years to wade into the slowdown pool you know yeah uh but yeah when when i was going uh uh we should probably give your your viewers a little background into into what happened but uh i remember things were popping in 2007 and i, I did 100 shows in 11 countries that year and awesome. i was not ready you know at, i i knew how, when i started i knew how to paint i'm a speed painter that's what jason hasn't told you so the elevator yeah, well speed. i was gonna get into it <laughs> oh i'm sorry <laughs> i'm just letting you go <laughs> well do you want to go ahead yeah no i was gonna i was i wanted to to uh you know i wanted to first of all like i was just looking at some videos before i had you on um and i, I rewatched the one with you on jimmy fallon which was pretty awesome um it's pretty cool to see you know they're playing the ray charles music and how you're doing it along with the music and everything it was it was really fun to watch that and and you know the and I, I should point out that jason is also a very fine musician played guitar and band for how many years <laughs> oh the, well, that was a that was a different lifetime ago no um, uh, yeah well me too <laughs> my brother-in-law said i played the band for 10 years in a different lifetime and my brother-in-law yeah. said i've heard you play and i've seen you paint i'm like damn it yeah <laughs> no it was uh, i want to be a player <laughs> You know, yeah, my, my music years, I mean, there's there's a chance I might do a new record actually with an older band. Oh. Um, they, they've never stopped and they're going to they they want to do um, they've been moved on to other bands and different things like that. But mm -hmm. they want to do like a reunion record of our band from like 20 years ago. So I, I'm not opposed to the idea. So that might happen. But but um, how what What's I'm curious the name of your band. Oh, that one was called Left Out. Yeah, I had there, that one was left out and there was another one with the same guy called the blamed. And uh, it was, you know, like kind of like hardcore, um, like punk, basically, you know, I, it, that's yeah. Have you ever heard of Rancid? The band yeah. Rancid it was, uh -huh. it was along those lines. I would I've say I've got some in the fridge. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was, it was kind of like that. But so what I wanted to ask you, though, like to let everybody know that, you, that you're a speed painter is I just wanted to. To maybe if you could set up a little bit of how you even got into that and then you know because it's such an interesting thing um to be able to you know it's like i'm curious i've got a lot of questions about the speed painting but i guess uh, let's, he's trying let's, to knock me off you ready to yeah, go huh yeah <laughs> but like I, i've yeah i'm ready to go um but first like i would you know what what, what got you into it? like what got you thinking about doing the speed painting thing um uh, because so, i mean it did start off with you know, first you were, you did the live caricature thing. And, um, and again, you, you are an entertainer. You told me before that, um, you've also did, did some stand up. So, you know, you're used to being in front of a crowd and, and entertaining. Um, I, I guess I'm just, I'm almost even thinking right now, just the idea of the fact that you were stand up and you needed live caricatures. Um, the, the, the live speed painting thing seems like, like, uh, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's like, uh, what would you think would happen if um, there was a some kind of a cult that would just, you know, if you were going to imagine a cult coming from Judaism, what would it be like? And you'd be like, oh, it'd be like Christianity. <laughs> so right. like, so, okay. so, so obviously, <laughs> that, so obviously you're the speed paving is like, is like that, that cult like branch off of, you know, stand up comedy um, and live caricature. That's what I'm imagining anyway. Well, I, 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 I just <laughs> dabbled in stand up comedy. I did it, you know, it takes about two years to find sort of find yourself in stand up and start to be really funny consistently. And that was about as long as I did it. And my wife just hated it because the only material, <laughs> as you know, 
uh, that I had as a father, you know, was my kids and my family and suburban life and just making fun of that kind of stuff that, and, and I did it after I was already a speed painter, uh, but I hadn't broken yet. Um, and, uh, uh, but no, the, the caricatures, uh, I did that 1977. Uh, I, okay. Let's just start at the beginning because That's I think the year I was born of, by the way. <laughs> oh my God. I'm so old and yeah. you're so young, uh, but, uh, I, I feel old. it wasn't me. <clears throat> okay. You're not my long lost son, yeah. <laughs> but, but no, uh, uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So let's just go all the way back. Uh, I've since been doing a little bit of, uh, therapy, which has been really good in helping to figure out what, what's wrong with me. And I've really come to realize how much of a part my ADD uh, has played in my life. And I yeah. think a lot of artists, probably most artists have ADD or something We're we're on the spectrum, I think, <laughs> for you to want to sit and paint a painting all day. Uh, who, who would want to do that, you know? Yeah. But in, in my case, uh, I was, I, my dad worked in uh, uh, the Petro, he was uh, worked for Exxon Mobil and was in personnel. And uh, we were in California and I've spent the years from about, I was five to 10 in California. The schools were ahead. They were open-minded to creative individuals. I was doing great in school, moved to Texas. Everything's memorization. I'm a bad boy. You're not listening. You're not paying attention. They don't, you know, uh, memorize these times tables, you know, all this. It just, I started making bad grades from the fifth grade up. And by the time ninth grade came around, it was the seventies. I was high all the time. Uh, cause I think I was trying to cope with everything and I flunked the ninth grade and it was devastating, you mm -hmm. know, cause I was from a good family, whatever, a good family situation. My mom loved my dad, all this kind of stuff. I had every privilege you could have, you know, but, but I was devastated, you know, and, uh, and my, I got into trouble. I got into more trouble. I got into, I was acting out in strange ways. And my dad was very smart. And when I got expelled from school for a little bit, suspended, um, he said, well, you're not going to sit at home and do nothing. So he took me to a psychiatrist, which was one of his old university professors at U of H. And they tested me with the, you know, uh, aptitude tests. And I was like acing the abstract reasoning and just flying through this stuff. And, uh, and the guy said, well, you know, uh, I, I, dad said, what are we going to do with this crazy kid? He says, well, I, I can't tell you I'm a psychiatrist, psychologist, but he's your kid. But if it was my kid, I'd probably get off his back and send him to art school. And that changed my life because I had identity, you know, all of a sudden I knew who I was. I started drawing for the school newspaper. I'd go down the hall. Hey, artist, you know, uh, I got involved in, in my church and, and I'm, I'm not involved in church at this point, but I was into the whole evangelical scene way back then. And actually it was very good for me. I'll have to say to have a social group that was with a new set of friends mm -hmm. that weren't stoned all the time. And I had, yeah. a, you know, I was able to get my shit together, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, it was very, very helpful, the community and everything. And I was singing in the choir and singing in a little ensemble and running track in high school and getting in the district finals. And just my life was changed. And so I, he, they begged and got me into Sam Houston State with an arts, for, for art. And all of a sudden, I found my people. And you know what that's like as an artist, right? I mean, you, you, when you, all of a sudden you walk into the ad agency or whatever, and you're like, we're all, we're on the island of misfit toys, you know, we're all in here. You join the yeah. caricature network. It's like, oh my God, we're all like this. So, so that was the thing. And what's exciting now is my son is coming to me and now he's studying to be a speed painter and he's very good. And it's the same story. He's now found himself as an artist and he's, he's different in two years, you know, his personality's changed, his, he's much calmer, he's, he's accomplishing things. And I didn't know what I had in this kid, you know, he's just brilliant. So mm, it's really awesome. exciting to see art and whatever it is, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's being an accountant, whatever it is, when you, when you find your thing, man, uh, it can change lives. And that's, that's really beautiful. So yeah. now we're gonna pass oh, the sure. plate. As the as they reverently and silently sing. 
I'll get off the, the sermon, you know. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, that's all nice and so on. Um, <laughs> no, but um, but we're let's go edgy, right? But where where did you where did you come up with the idea though? With the oh, fair with, enough, I stole yeah. it. Of course, I stole it, and I started it because our family was upside down on credit card debt. Oh. There's there's the truth. Um, there was an artist <laughs> named. There, uh, there you go. There was a guy named Denny Dent that uh, was the father of this art form. And I was uh, drawing, I used to do watercolor caricatures and do these real elaborate, you know, kind of Mort Druckery, not as good as Mort, but you know, that kind of more elaborate stuff in the studio as mm -hmm. gift items. And I'd spend, you know, 10 hours on them or 20 hours sometimes on these, you know, just with brush and ink and comic booking them out and stuff. And uh, so I was working late and Letterman came on and Denny was on Letterman and I freaked out and he was painting uh, Jimi Hendrix. And I started screaming, you know, I, I had a little television I'd keep on the edge of my studio because it with my ADD, it would kind of calm me down to have something happening in the room when I was alone. You know, yeah. I kind of need that, you know. Um, so uh, lately I've been exercising to calm me down. I, I get up and work out in the morning a little bit, a little light workout, and it, it makes me much easier for everybody around me to deal with when I'm not the hyper dog, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, so I was watching this and I started screaming and my wife goes, what are you yelling about? She's in the kitchen cleaning the dishes or something, you know? And I'm like, look at this guy. He's invented a new kind of rock and roll. You know, this was like 19, <laughs> 1989. Right. And he was starting to break, uh, Denny incidentally, if you ever see the Monterey, uh, pops festival, uh, he is in the film and he paints Jimi Hendrix on a brick wall, hmm. uh, with brooms he looks like a bum walking across this alley wow. and then he sees a wall and they start playing <laughs> purple haze or something you know and uh and then he or maybe it's the what dun, 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 you know, oh yeah one. yeah and he <laughs> takes this stuff and starts uh painting and it's Jimi hendrix and it's amazing and so but he used to do it upside down and stuff so i started looking into him and as the internet became a thing i started noticing other people speed painting and then I started noticing them being in the entertainment business and making a lot of money. And I said, wow, that's for me, you know, and literally every summer, you know, the drill, if you were a caricaturist, Christmas, you'd make a lot of money. January had teeth. You get into project graduation season and trade show season. Then summer in the East coast, you can still make money in the summer in Houston. Nobody goes outside cause it's hot. So you can either work at a theme park for minimum wage which I did for nine seasons and, or you can, uh, you know, kind of starve. And we just really didn't have much money that summer. And so we were heading into it. So I, I took what money I had, I rented a mini warehouse and I bought some canvas. It was supposed to be climate controlled, which meant 80 to 85 degrees. Right. And, uh, and I started rehearsing and it was a 10 by 12 space. It was so small that I had to open the hallway. And fortunately there was another empty space behind me and I could get into the empty space to set up a camera because otherwise I was too close to even video. And I just videoed my stuff and I looked at the videos every night and I just kept practicing, practicing. And it was about nine months of practicing um, before I landed an actual gig. And then I just, everybody I talked to, yeah, I'm going to be a speed fan. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Just all my entertainment agent friends. I finally landed a gig. Fourth of July, um, it got me on. Uh, I, my friend saw it and said, "Man, that's really cool." I got I painted Statue of Liberty at this thing. I got paid like six hundred bucks or something at this festival, you know. And and they put me on at six thirty in the evening because they I was an unknown act and nobody was even in the place till nine thirty, right? Yeah, for a fireworks show. So, you know, but at least the other entertainers saw me and this one guy got me on the news two days later and I did painted Statue of Liberty at dawn, two days, the 6th of July, you know, I got good video from that and put that on, sorry, building the website that attracted, uh, views. It sat on the website for two years. And then finally we got a call and it was this guy and he was a Vegas producer and they had a stage show. They had wanted to hire somebody like Denny or something, but they saw me and they said, Oh, he can do it. And I bet he's going to be a lot cheaper. And so I didn't know how to deal with it. So I got an agent 
friend of mine said, well, you act as agent for me because I'll give it away too cheap. And he negotiated a reasonable fee. And I got in the stage show. And then uh, I was the closing act because I made the biggest mess. At first, they put me in the middle. And I said, well, you know, I'm really a closer. And he said, well, Dan, I'm the producer. And, I, you know, I'll decide who's the closer of my variety show, you know. Yeah. And after we had one rehearsal and they saw the mess I made, they said, yeah, we're going to move you to the end. Yeah. <laughs> so I was the big finale. Yeah. And it got written up in the Atlantic City papers. And they, they panned the show kind of. They were just, they're vicious, you know. And I'm in there bragging, you know, to all the other talent. And it was amazing talent. I mean, they had... They had, I'd never seen talent this good, you know, and still the critics panned it because, oh, we've seen this sort of thing before. And they're talking about Mike Cavity, who's like a star of magic. And, you know, uh, Tina Leonard, his wife, who's like a star of Broadway. And, and they're just like being jerks, you know, but they wrote me up good. And I'm going around like Mike Wazowski going, look, did you see? I'm on the cover. <laughs> they're like, yeah, we saw yeah. it, Dan. I'm like, oh, <laughs> me, you know? That's funny. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> so that, that went, that went. And then with the video from that, my daughter, my 13 year old daughter put it on YouTube because I didn't know how to use YouTube. And, uh, and I just put up the video of Ray Charles and Statue of Liberty, two different videos. And they started going viral and I didn't even know it. And people were starting to call us and I'd say, well, that thing I've had 150 views and a hundred of them were me checking it every day. You know, and they were like, no, you've had 10,000 views. And the next day it was 40,000 views. And it ended up doing the Ray Charles video ended up doing 13 and a half million views. And then hmm. eventually just recently the, uh, they pulled it because of copyright issues. So it's not up there anymore. So you have to take my word for it, but, uh, <laughs> that was enough to get me on, uh, Ellen and Fallon and that attracted a manager. And this manager called me and said, I want to be your manager. And I'd looked around the Houston area and. I was like, these guys aren't, aren't national. They're not going to get what I need to get done out of this. And this guy called and said, hi, I'm with Feldman and Associates. We represent Nora Jones, James Taylor, Brian Adams, this and that. We're the, we're the, we're the William Morris of Canada. And I said, well, can Canadians are nice. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can trust this guy. And he's helped me, Justin Suds helped me to have a career instead of be a flash in the pan. And I can't tell you having a team I can't tell you how many times said, no, we're going to do this. And it's going to be great. And he's like, no, you don't want to do that. That's, that's going to be a wrong direction. That's going to devalue your brand. That's going to do this. That's good. And he's right. You know? So yeah, that's awesome. That's really yeah. good. Yeah. So yeah. we got on Ellen. That's why I got an age. That's why I yeah, love you what my agent an, is, yeah. is that he does. <clears throat> I mean, you know, I hate dealing with people and like, like the, like the, the paperwork and the contracts and the, and I, and I don't, you know, I don't want to like, you know, I'm too nice to, to like, like, I'll just say yes to things I shouldn't say yes to. Absolutely. Um, and my Absolutely. agent, my agent can be a dick to people. And that's what I, you need someone that, that can be a dick, you know, and, 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 uh, he's a great dick, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a dick <laughs> story about that. So I get on Ellen, right? I got on, I got on Carson Daly first and that got us credentials that got us on Ellen. Yeah. And then once we got on Ellen, that got us credentials where we could get on Fallon. And after we did that, then we did Super Bowl pregame show. And then we did Nat Geo channel. Then we did uh, Japanese TV, Turkish TV, Rachel Ray, Fox news in, in New York, which I'm not a big Fox news fan, but you know, I've performed for their thing in, in Manhattan three times or four times. Uh, Google, I've performed for Google seven times all over the world, including Athens. I was because I was a I was an early adopter, 13 and a half million views when YouTube was new was a big deal. And I, I happened to hit right when they came out with the iPhone that had a Google uh, YouTube button on it. And mm -hmm. so I hit that month when YouTube button came out on the iPhone and whoosh, they were hungry for content. So I was the 45th most viewed video on YouTube. And I know that because it said so on my video. It said, you are the 45th most. I was like, what the, you know, <laughs> it was crazy. And, and I mean, I remember Googling myself in that day. And it, it, Jason, it was insane. Um, it just, it, it just changed my life. And I'm still trying to figure out, that's why I'm seeing a therapist, you know, 
it's like I'm still trying to figure out it does things to you it messes with you and I'm like like uh you know everybody's so different I, I I haven't changed you know as as Neil Young says you know or, or uh not Neil Young was it uh Joe Walsh <laughs> Joe Walsh you know um life's been good to me so far but I mean it's it's I'm a minor I'm nothing I'm on the Z list you know I'm not a household name but it was enough that when I'd go there I'd get the good gigs you know and and once you have that kind of stuff everybody starts treating you different when you're on the road and then you get home and I'm sitting on my garden tractor mowing the yard and I get to be me again yeah and and uh and I've really, I've really tried to, to find that. And, not, and all I ever talk about around the family is my business, my business, my business. And I'm realizing, no, they want, they want to talk to dad. They don't want to, they don't want to know about the, you know, the latest art project I'm on or whatever, you know, you've got to find balance in your life. And, and when you get busy and successful, probably, as you know, with doing time magazine covers and stuff, you know, they, they treat you a little differently, right? When you go talk to other artists mm. and, it's just an illusion, right? Yeah. It's just, it's a construct and you need it to succeed. You need that fame as an artist or recognition in some way, or yeah. you're going out for the lowest possible price and you're devalued by your clients. So it's a, it's a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I, um, it's funny, like in the past, I've, I've heard from people that I don't really like anyways, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that really annoy me. Um, and also that's and what we, you're going to say about me when I'm we, off. we obviously, yeah, we obviously have like this, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm talking about the kind of people that you, you, you know, that you don't like each other very much, but, um, I've heard people like, Oh, so annoying. Like Jason, just when we go to these, you know, like a family get together, or if we've been to this or that, he just, he just talks about his art all the time. Um, and so that, like, this was like years ago, I heard this. And I was thinking, like, do I really just talk about my art all the time? And then I was telling my wife, I'm like, you know, like, because I kind of made a rule for myself, like, a long time ago. Yeah. That, like, it's it's what I do is it's not in the in, in the world of artists. It's not that weird. Like, you, you know, but right. no, you have to no, understand you have to understand to normal people um, what I do is like crazy awesome right like and, and you like oh my gosh you paint covers for time magazine or you do this or that or you you know you know whatever you painted it, the pope yeah <laughs> so but the thing is is like that's more interesting to to normal people than um oh i i work at the bank or whatever right so well you know when and, your life and, is a cubicle yeah you but know, see, the problem with God it is you end up, you realize, or I, I realized that, oh my gosh, like I end up having to talk about my stuff. Like, I, and, I, and I don't like that. I don't like going to like a, a friend's house or like a family get together. And it's just nonstop talking about, you know, it, it happens every once in a while. And, you know, and I, like, I was at a family thing recently and, and, um, and, uh, and my and aunt and uncles, and the family that they hadn't seen for years came over and they pulled out the, all the time magazine covers I did. And it was a little embarrassing, but mm -hmm. at the same time, they're very proud. They're and, very proud of you. Yeah. Yes. And so I, I'm like, whatever, it's cool. And it was just that one time. So it's not a big deal, but, yeah. but then what ends up happening is you end up having to talk about your art all the time. And then, and then, and then uh, they were like, what else are you doing? And I tell them like, Oh, I do, I would do stand up comedy as well. And, and then, and I was like, I wish I didn't do some stand up. I wish funny, I, man. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I wish I didn't say that. Cause no, no. Then they just, then I'm just sitting there. I'm like, it's like two hours. I'm just talking about myself, you know? And, yeah. and so yeah. I, I have like a rule um, for myself is I don't, I don't talk about what I do or what I've been doing or what I'm working on or anything until someone asks me first. Um, and then even then I'm just like, I try to keep it short. And the other thing I've been doing is I leave my, I leave my phone in the car like all the time now. Like when really? I go to, when I go out to dinner, uh -huh. uh, That's when I good. when I go to friends or family's house, I, I don't bring my phone with me because it's I, a good way to get your phone stolen. Yeah, but man, <laughs> it's it's a pet peeve of mine. Like, yeah, I, I no. can't stand like when I'm with people and they're on their phone. <laughs> yeah, it drives me nuts. And like if I'm going to someone's house, I want to, you know, unless 
and here's the thing if, if someone wants hey show me your artwork i'll be like eh my phone's in the car <laughs> I, don't, yeah, I don't have it with me you can google yeah. me or whatever because yeah. i I've, I, I, I don't know i don't know if this is like uh for my own mental health or just sanity but like you know i don't like to talk about me all the time or like um you know or i don't like to be if i'm at someone's house i don't want to be uh on my phone checking things when i'm at their house you know so like i've been that's that's been like the last few years i've been like i try to like uh, it's funny my wife gets annoyed sometimes she's like um can you can you use your phone because i'll ask her for her for her phone for something mm-hmm. you know like if i need to like um you know check something and she's like you, you, where's your phone I'm like oh it's in the car <laughs> you know so sometimes it backfires but but anyways <laughs> But um, hey, you you told me a brief story. I don't know if you care, carry if you want to talk about it or not. We don't have to about um your experience on the Ellen Show. Um, yeah. Oh, I was getting ready to that. Yeah, tell I, you that. I want I wanted to hear that about one? that. No, you 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 gave me a little like give me the tip of the of the penis. I got a lot of like man, I want I, I want whole, the whole shaft. It, it's a. I mean, I've been doing this <laughs> seventeen years now. You know, it's crazy that time has passed. So yeah. So yeah, I almost didn't get on Ellen. Because when I got there, I wasn't quite ready for prime time, you know, and I was nervous. And we're there in Bur- Burbank and I get up and they wanted to run a full rehearsal. So I prepared two canvases, one for the rehearsal, one for the show. OK. And we're painting Ray Charles and they want me to do it to uh, Kanye's um, uh, uh, oh. gold digger. You take my money. Well, yeah, which is based on Ray Charles. Uh, yeah, it's based on Ray <laughs> Charles's. Uh, uh, you have to you have to edit a lot of that song on Ellen, man. <laughs> well, yeah, I found a clean version, uh, but but yeah, um, she ain't messing with no gold digger. But she yeah. ain't messing with a broke bloke. Is it broke broke or broke? It bloke? probably is. Never broke figured broke. That out. Yeah. broke broke or broke Something. bloke. He's broke bloke. English, probably broke broke. I think it's broke uh, broke. But but yeah, so I get up and I and I run it, and I got to the reveal, and and Ray Charles is cool because. Like I start with it upside down and I put a couple of things and I did, then I'm like, now nah, I don't know, you know, and the audience is like, I, I, mm, yeah. what's going on? And a I try job. to, call them. <laughs> it, the theory is that, that the more they hate me, the more they go, Oh, what is this artsy fartsy? What's this? Seriously. We're having to watch this. It's like watching paint dry. Oh my God. The more they hate me, the more they love me when I, when I flip it and it's something at the end. Yeah. And Ray Charles works. It's like, I was, I was just right. I'm starting to keep a journal. I was just writing about this this morning, but Ray Charles was lightning in a bottle for me of all the pieces I did. This one would hide until I paint in the teeth. It could be upside yeah. down. I could have <laughs> the whole thing done. No teeth. It was just abstract shapes, put the teeth in and flip it. Boom. All of a sudden it was there all along. And, and I've got a few other pieces that are like that, but I've got, I've done hundreds of pieces and there's maybe a dozen that are even close. And Ray Charles, I've been doing it so long that I've got a whole routine. So the music stops and I stop and I'm like, ah, you know, ah, everybody, you know, clap, get them going, mess around and all. And I get to the hair and I go, and I play the piano riff while I'm doing his little, uh, yeah. you know, gray hair and stuff. So I've got a piece for everything. And finally I get to the thing and I forgot to paint his teeth and I revealed him on Ellen for the, for the, re- for the rehearsal. And here, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it didn't look good. And then I went, Oh, silly me. I forgot the teeth. Oh, Hey, Oh, here we go. Yeah. You know? And they were just like, this guy's, this guy's not ready. You know? And my manager says, yeah, well, why don't you go back to the hotel room? And I got this for now. And, uh, everything's cool. Everything's cool. I'll call you a little bit. Uh, like, hmm, I don't know. I guess we wait, you know, so I'll go to the hotel room and he calls me. He says, yeah, they're not going to get you on today. And I was like, well, what's the, they too full. Did they overbook it? Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. They, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to get me freaked out, you know? So, uh, so he's like, yeah, something like that. But, you know, and then finally it comes out what had happened. And, and I said, I said, man, I, I was just nervous. It's going to be fine tomorrow. I won't make the same mistake twice. You know, he goes, I told him, I told him you've done Ray Charles a thousand times, you know, it's going to be fine. And I've got you on for tomorrow. No, no, I've got to be at university of Virginia for a halftime show tomorrow. I, we've had that contract for six months. He goes, 
ah, we're going to get you out of that. You're going to stay the night in Burbank and be on tomorrow. I was like, no, my word is my bond. You have to, we have to honor this, you know, yeah. I'm a word of, you know, I've been doing caricatures for 30 years. You know, I know you a commitment's a commitment. I got to get on a plane. You know, he's like, if you go, they are not going to ever have you back on Ellen. And if they don't have you on Ellen, I can't get you to the next thing because word will spread in the industry that you fucked up on Ellen and that your career is going to be over. You know, I was like, yeah. Oh, okay. I guess I'm staying, you know? And he calls the guy in university of Virginia. The guy goes, so you mean to tell me that Dan Dunn is more important for him to be on Ellen DeGeneres than to fulfill a contract that we've had for six months with the university of Virginia. And my manager starts laughing and he goes, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm telling you for my client's career. That's yeah. exactly the right thing. And we ended up getting on and Taylor Swift was on at the second day. Tay -tay. And I'm Tay -tay. And I'm looking over at Taylor <laughs> Swift and she's back going, that's amazing. You know, yeah. just kind of watching. And that's what my manager <laughs> said. She said, I, I didn't notice her. I was busy painting, but, um, but yeah, uh, Ellen reran it twice during the summer. So I got uh, 20 million views each time from the first and then two times during the summer. And, and then that got me on Fallon and one thing leads to another, but, uh, my, my funny, you awesome. want to hear another, you want to hear another story? Or you want to say anything yeah. about that? Yeah. 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 No, I was going to say that. I mean, that's gotta be nerve wracking. Um, you know, just, just to, you know, I just to be on, on something like Ellen show anyways, but you know, it's already a lot of pressure, you know, you know, people are, a lot of people are going to be watching you and you've got to perform, but then to have, any you know like I'll, I'll i'll tell it to you this way the first time i ever did a real stand-up show oh yeah yeah um, yeah i uh i was super nervous i had never done stand-up before right i'm i'm talking i didn't have i didn't even do mics nothing and a huge comic i've talked about this many times in this podcast steve Byrne. he's a big comic um he, i had him on my podcast and we had a great talk and he said hey i want you to, you got to try stand up man he was he's like you could see it in me and he's like yeah, I, yeah. um he's like i want you to open for me at the chicago improv so whoa so that was the first time i ever did stand up was Dude, the chicago improv but it was yeah. terrifying and it was yeah. and in a way yeah. it's like it's insane it's like yeah. it's insane that i did it. it it's insane that i was like yeah sure i can do that but i spent <laughs> 5 months working on 5 minutes of material yeah and uh, and it, and I just was working and working, working and did it. So I get to the show and I'm already super nervous. It's a, it's a real club, real crowd opening for a, a big headliner. And, and, uh, but I'm feeling good about my material. I have it down. I think it's funny. Um, and, Crickets. and then, no, no, <laughs> the, what happened was the, 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 I don't know if it was the manager of, of the comedy club or whoever it was, he's, he was like, he's up there with the club he came in and started talking to me about the light and he's like so when do you uh when when do you want when do you want the light and everything and i was like what do you mean like it's such a yeah, right. basic thing for every, anyone that's done comedy knows about the light and he was like how do you not know about what the light is and i was like ah, ah. and i had to explain to him what was going on and he was like You've You're never, about to get up on stage yeah, open and, for a headliner and you don't and, know that they, yeah. they're going to tell everybody what the light well, is. Well, the light, the light is basically to let you know your time is up. Yeah. You have like it's a warning light. It's basically like you got one minute left. Basically. Right. Like oh, you, 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 sometimes you can time, you can tell me, Hey, I want, give me the light at, so, at two minutes, you know? So I know what to right. start this bit or whatever. So he was like, I don't know what Steve is thinking. Um, we don't ever let anybody play in this club. That's not a like experienced comic. He goes, uh, he must like you a lot. Um, he goes, I hope you do well. And all there of a sudden nothing. everything. And I was just freaked out now. Oh, now yeah, I'm like, yeah. 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 Now Talk I'm about like pressure. All the wind was taken out of my sails. Yeah. Yeah. And and then when, then they're like, you know, this, then, the, then the guy that um, introduced that he was, he was um, the host, uh, he was like the host MC. He's actually a pretty well-known Chicago comic. And he introduces me. He's like, everyone, please welcome to the stage. A very funny com Chicago comedian, Jason Seiler. And everyone's like, yeah. And I'm like, 
this is my first show. Very funny Chicago comedian. Like, I, I, I was getting in my head immediately. Like, right, right. like I am like, was it running in slow motion? Like, very funny Chicago comedian. No, it was like, oh yeah. I was like, I get, I grabbed the mic and I was oh. like, I didn't even know. I didn't even know to take to take the mic out and move the stand out of the way. Like it was, yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I did. But the thing is, is oh, I did. I, I didn't. I love bomb. this horror story because I could, I could. T- I've been, man. But, it's but it was just terrifying. So, so the first, I remember, like first time I go to open my mouth, my, it was like this, <laughs> like that. <laughs> but um, within the first five seconds or so, I got, I got my first laugh like immediately, and once I got my first laugh, right, right, I was when like, I just. Sales. I just went for it and I, yeah, man. and I over, I, I overacted. I hammed it up. That's okay. Um, you can overact. Yeah. And, uh, and it was, it was great. Um, hold on a second. I gotta tell my wife something. The keys are in the bag thing next to the front door. We'll keep that in the podcast. It's real this life. Is, this is a real podcast. So, yeah, this is, this is real. This so anyways, real um, I, I, I did the uh, I did it and uh, it went really well. I got laughs everywhere I wanted the laughs everywhere I needed them, and uh, and then I went backstage and Steve goes, he goes, yeah, that was that was really actually pretty good. Um, maybe next time don't open with a masturbation joke, but uh, <laughs> he was like, but good. Then he then he asked me to to, to do the next two nights, um, and then a year and a half or so later, almost two years later. Um, he asked me to open for him three more times at the, at the Chicago Improv. So and I've opened for him five times now because one of the oh, nights man. I wasn't able to make it. But, um, but yeah, that. So I understand what you're saying is like that. Like already being on something like Ellen is already like okay, whew, I got to get this right. But then like, oh, by the way, she she doesn't know if she has any confidence in in you after your mistake. <laughs> you That's know? exactly what happened. So That's like, exactly what happened. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and, and see, I had done stand up before because when I first started doing it, I did that show at the Woodlands, you know, and then I did that thing on, you know, Good Morning Houston. I started, did a little insurance show. I noticed my knees were shaking. And I was like, man, I played in the band. I used to get up, you know, guitar and bass and keyboards and everything. And, uh, but it's been too long. And I said, maybe if I do stand up, I'll come up with some material and I can do a painting and tell a few jokes and do a painting and tell a few jokes, you know, give me some material I could work into my corporate act. Yeah. But of course, when you're doing the comedy club, everything is fuck this and fuck that. And, you know, <laughs> masturbation jokes and poop jokes and, you know, you're, you, you got nothing you can use. It's my whole set. Give it yeah, away my material. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I started doing stand up, and man, I would just, I just would like, like I told you, I was telling you about it, but I would just, uh, uh, you know, what if the, what if the uh, create, what is creativity? Where does it come from? What if the creativity meant for, I don't know, a televangelist somehow, it, or, or, or Jimmy Page to inspire him? What if that actually went into a televangelist by mistake? Mistakes happen, you know? <laughs> and, and I just, oh, there's a lady who's sure. All that glitters is gold, and she's buying the stairway to heaven. Yeah, you know, and all that. And I'd pace back and forth, you know, <clears throat> and she's buying the stairway to heaven. And it actually would be kind of a pretty good little sermon. You know, there are two paths you can go down, but in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. You know, just stuff like that. And and I just goofy. Well, and then you, uh, if there's a bustle in your hedgerow, don't be alarmed now. It's just a spring clean for the May Queen. <laughs> and just look puzzled because it'd be so ridiculous, you know. Oh my gosh! But just silly, silly stuff. But but uh, and then I did things about my kids. You know, I think I told you the one. I, I raised five kids. We had two bathrooms in the house. One was in the master bedroom, and you know, and then in the hall. And five kids getting everybody up, going to school in the morning. It was a madhouse. And I had three daughters. So tell you the truth, yeah. I just go take a leak in the front yard, you know, yeah. wave at the neighbors, whatever. That's <laughs> because my son was using the backyard. He was taking a crap in the backyard. And well, he likes his <laughs> privacy. Yeah. You know, and just yeah. stupid stuff like that. You know, I wrote a, a parody about uh, set to Bohemian Rhapsody. It was about, 
my backyard and, you know, just mowing the grass and, you know, can't even remember it. Just stupid stuff. But, but the thing it did was uh, two things. There were stand-up comedies, there were, comics were in the room. And they, like this one guy uh, was, he toured with Cher for a while. Um, uh, and uh, come on, Dan, my chemo brain. I just can't. Uh, I, I had chemo surgery, uh, chemotherapy uh, three years ago, cancer free now. Oh, awesome. But I've still got, I've still, my brain's just, I get foggy. But uh, Tommy Drake is his name. Mm. Um, but uh, anyway, um, he was saying that when I walk out on stage, that I had command of the stage and that everybody gets quiet. And you know, when you're performing for other comics on open mic night, if they get quiet, it means you're important enough for them to listen to. If you're not funny at all, no stand-up comics don't laugh when you're in open mic night. They go, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's kind of how they react. So they would get quiet for my set and then I'd leave and just think that I was horrible. And they'd say, Oh man, you were great. No, they loved you. Love that joke about this and that, you know. But it made me <laughs> bulletproof. So by the time I got to Ellen, I was completely bulletproof. Yeah. But stand-up, I really recommend it because or any kind of theater arts like that because yeah. you, you get used to just dealing with the crickets and it's like you can't hurt me you yeah know? no I, I think it's true um i think like for me uh, you know i've done i did the band thing for years I, i'm a perf i'm a natural performer i love to be on stage i don't know what it is it's just i just i love the energy and the you're needy um yeah you're just needy. probably you're and needy <laughs> probably <laughs> But um, we all are, brother. But like the, um, you know, I, I noticed like, like, for example, like the years of me doing the band stuff um, of doing this, you know, being on stage, like, like my band mates used to freak out, like if one of their guitars are out of tune, I, right, like, right. I don't I don't like the dead silence. So I would start saying shit in the microphone and they're like, hurry up, tune your guitar. Siler's talking quick, you know, he's going <laughs> to say some crazy shit. And so they learned to tune the guitar pretty fast. Um uh, but but it gave me. But you confidence. played lead and everything too, right? Sometimes well, I was mostly rhythm guitar player. Brother, that's kind of what I was, and, and I played bass in a different band. But like I this, would, it gave I would me screw this. Uh, lead up. Every time it would be time for me to go lead, the band would be watching because I get up and it'd be like, okay, I've been rehearsing this. We've done it in her studio over and over and over. Here we go. And then now here's Dan solo. Like every time I would get stage fright and screw the solo up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like Paul McCartney said, that's what made Paul a bass player. You know, he said, he said, uh, he said, yeah, you know, I, so I figured I'd be better off at bass and let the other lead guitar. I had, all, we had three guys that could play lead guitar, you know, okay. so I'll just got George handle it or John, they can handle the lead. <laughs> you know, I'll just sit back here and play bass. Um, I forgot what I'll say. Oh, well, I, what I was trying to say though, is that, that it, you know, I, I recommend the, the stand up stuff too, because like just from being in the bands, when I started to, you know, to get into my, uh, my caricature illustration type stuff, you know, the first few years were, it was ter you know, terrifying because I had to talk to a lot of art directors and, um, and it, and I was so afraid and I didn't have the confidence. Um, um, but you know, like once I went to New York for the first time, and I had to be forced to be in front of art directors and meet them that's in person. That's really scary. That, but that's where I realized, oh, these are just people, right, and right. and I know how to talk in front of people, and I and that and you know, so that that helped me to be able to, you know, to do it more. And the more I did it, the more I got better. And then, and then eventually, you know, I started doing like workshops with schools and stuff like that. Where, you know, after about five or six of those, I'm like, all right, I feel I feel pretty comfortable in front of people. So. When I eventually started doing um, the stand-up, it was um, it feels very natural for me. But the funny thing about it <laughs> is that because I started when I was, um, you know, f so I've been doing it for two years now, about two years, and um, but I don't really count it full two years because of COVID. It like I had to take time off from it, but I still wrote all the time. Um, but, uh, but basically what I think I started at 42 is when I was started. Yeah. I was 42 the first time I did stand up mm. and it's just funny to me because I, I feel like, you know, 
at first, I, I part of the reason why it took me forever to do stand up is because I kind of felt like, oh man, it's 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 I, I can't do it. You know, I got too much going on. I got family, I got the kids, I got a career, mm-hmm. I got to work, I got to you know all this kind of stuff. I don't have time for stand up. All the podcasts and different things to listen to. It's like you have to do it every single night of the week. Sometimes mm-hmm. two, three times a night if you can. Is get up as much as possible. And I was like, it's just impossible for me to do that. And then I also thought, you know, these people usually start when they're like in, like in their late teens or early 20s and I'm 42. And but the thing I found out for me personally is that I think gives me an advantage. And I've noticed when I when I like I don't hear. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't give a fuck about anything anymore. I don't care what you think about me. That's um, beautiful. My opinion. I wish I could. Like, my my opinion um, that's beautiful like like the, the funny thing is is so basically i'm just loving doing the stand-up thing because right i i have i just have these weird things that pop into my head yeah to do and, I, and i'm trying and i'm trying to like push i'm like every mm-hmm. single week i try to push and push last week i did seven or no five minutes uh on 72 virgins <laughs> <laughs> and I was nervous because it was a very touchy subject for some people, but I pushed yeah. it and I made it ridiculous and it was so much fun. And I was like, I, I was having so much fun on stage, just like, like, you know, getting into this, the, the, these weird thoughts that I have about uh, religion and 72 virgins, but I did it in a way that wasn't insulting towards Islam or people that believe it was from a perspective, as far as you know, no, no, no. I, I, not, I, trust me, I do it in a very clever way. You know, Jason Seiler. I do it in a way where it's it's more about the perspective of a of a silly, dumb white guy who doesn't understand. But at yeah. the same time, I turn the whole bit into really about virgins, and and so you forget in a way that I'm talking about, you know, what some people believe. I twist it and turn it, and then there's a reveal at the end. But anyways, it was it was what I'm, my point is is. I don't care. And, um, you know, Norm McDonald passed away recently oh, yeah. and, uh, he's uh, such a big influence, uh, to me and my style of comedy, I think, because I'm yeah. very dark. Um, and I, the one thing I loved about him is he didn't care. He, he didn't care. He just went for it. He, even if, even if he was bombing, he went even harder into it he did he did and he's like okay well i'm gonna keep going <laughs> and 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 that's the thing i love about it is um i love getting on the stage and just you know like you were saying like what I, what i like to do for you know is have a little bit of I, I use silence a lot so i maybe i'll just hold the mic and just kind of look at people for a little bit and look around before i say anything and people are like, what's That's he doing? Really and, then I, yeah, yeah. And, and then I, yeah. And then, then there's, I'll do like pauses and different things, but uh-huh. I'm just having so much fun feeding off of the energy and like, and, you know, not really knowing exactly where it's going to go, you know, but it was my whole point to all this was that I agree with you what's about, point? about the, the, you know, it's good for people to, I think to, to get into stuff like that, or even like, you know, poetry, like do live readings or whatever it is, right. because as right. an artist, uh-huh. When you are able, when you're confident enough to be able to get in front of people and talk like that, you're going to be able to do a lot more with your work. You're, you're going to be able to, yeah. to talk with a lot more people. Um, Cause I mean, in my line of work, I have to have meetings constantly with people, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. it helps. Like I had a meeting yesterday where I had, I had to talk with like, I think five or six people on the phone and, and the, my, my comedy comes through, they don't know I do comedy. They're just like, oh, we're hiring this guy to illustrate stuff for us. But I'm like, I'm having them dying laughing like half the conversation because I, I, I there's like a spot for me. Oh, there's a, they can put that in there. I know. I, it's my it's comedy, so much fun. <laughs> my comedy, man. I, it, it's like, I, I'm always trying to say the funny thing. And I'm actually, I'm actually talking to my therapist about it because a lot of times it turns out being very hurtful to people. And I'm just trying to make a joke. And I'm trying to understand what is my need to always be funny. And I, I think I need to have a little bit more of a switch where I can turn it off and turn it on and know when it's appropriate and when it's not, because I'm just the, doing caricatures, you know, 
uh, 30 years, you know, you got people in the chair, you've got to get them to smile. You got to get them to lighten up. You got to tell some corny dad jokes and you got to be yeah, friendly. Yeah. And, and so you're just, you're just always on with every kind of caricature. If you're a caricaturist, a good caricaturist, you're a student of humor, you know, you're, and, and if you're a good stand up comic, you're a, you're not just doing your own stuff. You're studying other comics. You're studying why comedy works and and what the line. It's like like I would tell that joke, like I said about the 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 uh, I take a piss in the front yard, wave to the neighbors. When I tried it, where I'd say I go pee in the front yard, that's because my son's uh, doing number two in the backyard. It wouldn't go over. Yeah. But if I said piss and shit, it would go over. If I said fuck, it would go over, but but in that crowd, right? Because but if but and people don't understand that. It's like, oh, why are they so dirty? It's like because those are the words that, you know, it it, it you've got to use the right word. You know, uh, Mark Twain said, you know, the difference between the right word and an almost right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. You yeah. know, and uh, <laughs> yeah. So well, how much time? How long is this podcast? <laughs> do you have time for one more story or yeah are you getting bored um no no, no, I'm, just, no I'm just kidding good lord this is killing me <laughs> no 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 um no yeah i how, wanted to know how much more i didn't want to take up the whole you know well how about let's sure do we this got to the let's, good let's, stuff let's, let's do this real quick um time for I, station I, I, identification i want to hear um one more story but first i want to show you some fan art real quick Oh yeah, okay. And cool. then we'll we'll do that. Fan art. You need a fan art theme song. You know, <laughs> sometimes I art, sometimes I put art. a thing in there, but it's time for fan art. Boring, <laughs> boring. All right, here we go. So the art <laughs> with the paintbrush through my head is perfect. So he's made uh, me way too good looking there. <laughs> this yeah. first one's by Paula Petluani. Good, and, good job, Paula. Yeah, I, like I don't. It. I don't know if uh, if it's. I guess maybe it, it is kind of. I don't know if it's supposed to be going through your head or what, but it works through my head. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there's nothing in there in the way. I saw this one the other day. That's interesting. Yeah, this from Joe uh, Bonfim. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And he's got the little textured stuff all over the matching hat, but it's yeah. kind of like a blue meanies kind of smile, like a Beatles kind of <laughs> right, right, right. You know. Yeah. I like it. This one's pretty cool. This is by uh, <laughs> Mr. Ponce. <laughs> Who is this by? Mr. Ponce. Mr. Ponce thinks I have knockers. Yeah. <laughs> God, that's beautiful, though. Look at that. Yeah, that's it's, cool. It's scary how much that it looks more like me. You know, it's like if I were a bodybuilder, that would be me. It's like power thirst, power thirst. Yeah. You'll have so many babies. <laughs> <laughs> They'll all be from Kenya. Oh my gosh. Um, this one is pretty oh, cool. Man. This is by Pablo Salas. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Where's Pablo at? Is he in Spain or somewhere? I don't know, actually. Yeah. Not sure. But yeah, I like I always love his drawings. They're pretty cool. So loose. Fun. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And this is by Jean oh, Lemony. Oh my god, that looks like my dad. <laughs> oh my goodness that's interesting that's precious i really would like to have a, a print of that that's i'll, I'll that's, email these all to you oh that is so scary like my dad it's <laughs> unbelievable I'm, I'm actually honored by it you know i love my dad he, he passed two years ago three years oh, ago sorry yeah that's and amazing. uh this, <laughs> this is cool this is the last one this is by dominic zeilinger he's a player i'm a player <laughs> it's the d card yeah. The hell was that even me? <laughs> My eyebrows are not gray, but they they also probably don't float above your hat. They probably either. also don't <laughs> float in my hat. Yeah, that's look how the palette is like a, a clubs, you know. Yeah, that's really funny. Thank you, that's thank awesome. you guys. Cool. cool. So let's hear this story. I want to hear another story. Then we'll okay. wrap this so up. This is my most famous story. So, um, and I don't tell it, I can't tell it to clients, but, uh, but if they hear it, they hear it. it was, I was coming up, as, as I said, it was 
things were going crazy and I had so much to do that I wasn't able to rehearse as much as I wanted to. And I wasn't, I was just, you know, I'd, I'd come and I'd come home and get in the studio and I'd be there a number of days and I'd be exhausted from the road or whatever. And I, it just, I was showing up as good as I could for shows, but I, it, I was too popular for a little bit of time. And, um, and so I got hired by Simon Cowell had his 50th birthday party in Lon outside of London at this estate. Uh, and it was like this British admiral's uh, estate. And he had never even been in the house. He had the house built while he was fighting the war in France. Then he lost the war. So they executed the admiral and uh, you know, back in 1700s or something. So there's this huge mansion and Simon spends $3 million on throwing a birthday party for himself. And he's hired all these entertainers and uh, Simon's girlfriend, this lady, a uh, former girlfriend, this lady named Sonetta, who had been a pop star in England, hires me to, to do this thing. And she wants, and I'm saying, well, can I do Ray Charles? Can I do repertoire? Can I do stuff I'm solid with? No, Simon's a Frank Sinatra fan. Can you do Sinatra? Well, I don't really have a good Sinatra, but yeah, I could probably do it. And you know, and, and we want to put Simon and Sinatra together on the same painting. I'm like, uh, it's much better to do one painting, reveal it, get a reaction, do the second painting, reveal it, get a reaction. I can work the crowd. It's not as long. Two minute people on one. It's going to be a 10 minute piece. They're not going to hang with me. It's going to be tough. And I'm performing for 400 A-listers in yeah. this audience, right? It's like Ozzy's there, uh, Sir Paul uh, you know, Elton John is there, you know, in the audience and stuff. And so you talk about the pressure being on. And so I start working on this and I get this great idea of making this stupid little sign. I made like the Las Vegas sign out of foam core. And then I found this electro wire that you could make it like have lights flash on it. And I got all involved in trying to dress up my act for this big show, I got uh, my, my ADD hyper focus went into, Oh, if I had this sign, I could do this painting. And then when the painting's there, the sign could come up from behind and it would flash and say, happy birthday, Simon. And I think I was compensating for the fact yeah. that it wasn't going to be really that great of a painting. And what I should have been doing is saying, no, 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 don't do that. Get a good Sinatra, get a good Simon Cal nail this stuff. Right. Yeah. So, but, but I, it was coming. Okay. In the studio. I thought, yeah, I got it. But by the time you fly over there and you're jet lagged and everything else, and you come into this place and the paparazzi's there because you're going into the party at Simon Cowell's thing, you know, and they look in the thing, oh, who's that? Oh, he's a speed painter. Oh, we don't care. <laughs> and off I go and I get in and, uh, and they've got the decorations are just set up there. There's, there's a big room and there's a main stage. And then there's two other smaller stages and they decide that they can't give me the main stage because it's going to make too much of a mess. So let me set up on the side stage. Okay. I'm on the side stage and there's not enough clearance in the roof for the sign to come up over the painting at the end. So we have to walk it around and now it ends up looking like the little thing in spinal tap, you know, the little, the little stone hinge, Oh, <laughs> little stupid thing at the end. It just doesn't go over at all. And there's party decorations blocking my view all over the room, all the table, lavish flower things. You can't see anything anyway. And it's a mess. And my tour manager comes over, guy, Khalil Ashanti, a friend of mine was tour managing. And he comes over, he goes, you're not going to believe what you have to follow. I'm like what? He goes, well, you'll see. And I look up on stage, he goes, take a look. And there's a lady in a vagina costume and she's like, it's like the vagina with her legs down there. And then she takes a, um, like a tongue on her hand with sequins and she's going, Ooh, ah, Ooh. And she's dancing around stage. And it's like, it's like a Muppet with fur around the outside, black fur. And, I don't care how big of a dick you are or how big you think your dick is. You can't follow a dancing vagina. No, you, you cannot follow a dancing vagina. And 
So the dancing vagina comes on stage when we're finally there and everybody's howling and they just love it. And they wrote it up in the press where the press said, uh, Simon, Simon's mom said, uh, said, what's that, dear? And Simon said, I think it's a lips turned on its side, mom. And his mom goes, mm, you know, or something. And, and so I just bombed with it. You know, and I come out and I start painting and I hear people yelling, bring back the vagina. Oh, my you God. Know? Oh, heckling me. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just crushed, man. I'm just like, oh, God, I'm so depressed. I've I've I'm missed if they would have let me do thing or if I just would have worked on the thing more, if I just would have done everything, I was just beating myself up, you know, and and I, Earth, Wind and Fire is getting ready to go up. And I noticed they've got champagne backstage on the main stage. And I'm I had to cross the back of the main stage to get back to the green room. And uh and I'm back there and I said to the, to the green room lady, you know, oh, do you have any wine? You know, I'm, I'm ready for a glass of wine, you know? Oh, certainly. Oh, would you like, yeah, it's a glass, you know? I said, oh, it's white wine. Do you have any red wine? Oh, well, we can probably get you a bottle. Sure. You know? So I'm drink the red wine, white wine. I drink a little bit of it. They bring me a glass of red wine. I trade it off. I get the red wine. I said, can I take the bottle? Take it back to my wife. Now I'm walking. I'm, I'm still high on adrenaline, you know, from the performance. I walk back off across main stage and I'm talking to a Frank Sinatra impersonator. And I got a glass of wine in one hand, bottle of wine in another. I've only had one drink of wine, but I look like the tall Texan. I'm, I've been performing and I'm on adrenaline. So I'm, you know, got, I look like I'm hammered. Right. And there's strippers on stage. They had these five or six strippers and they're wearing these short bobbed wigs, you know, and they're topless and they're doing some kind of kick dance or whatever, and they come off stage. Now, they've been topless on stage. This is not a big deal in England. It would be scandalous in America, right? Wait, but this England, is all for Simon's birthday? He spent $3 million, Jason, <laughs> on his own birthday party. Yeah. <laughs> and it was written up <laughs> okay. in the press, you know? So anyway, <laughs> but all the handlers are trying to make sure that everything goes smoothly and they don't want any problems, right? And I'm yeah. not on my I'm not on my side stage striking where I should be. I'm on the main stage, backstage, hanging out, talking to a Frank Sinatra impersonator, and we're arguing about something, you know. And it, you, because I'd seen an effect in Houston, and he was saying, "No, this is the first time they'd ever used it." And we were, "Oh no, no, Houston's not some small town," and you know, blah blah blah. And I'm I'm it, it turns into a, more of an argument than a discussion. Yeah. And then this girl comes off stage. And she's topless and she puts, has a towel across her chest. And right as she comes off, she's taking her earring off and she drops the earring at my feet and she bends down to get it. And she's got her arm across her chest and her boobs are right here. And I'm a dude and I'm checking them out to see maybe if one pops out, you know, I'm only human. <laughs> and she reaches, she looks up and she makes eye contact with me and I'm looking at her tits. Yeah. And so so at the right. time, Friends was a big deal, mm. right? And Joey Trebbioli, you know, and all this, yeah. he's going, hey. So I just right. I just had the glass of wine. I go, how you doing? Yeah. You know, because yeah. I thought it'd be, I just tried to disarm it with a little humor. Well, they were getting the Me Too movement s several years before we got the Me Too movement. <laughs> and so I was a toxic male at that point. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> that's what I figure. Because right after that, the security guard comes over and goes, excuse me, are you the artist? And I think, oh, thank God, somebody liked it. You know, I said, why, yes. And he <laughs> says, well, uh, sorry, let's get into a complaint about you. And um, I'm afraid you've been asked to leave. <laughs> you could have knocked me over with a feather. You know, I was like, okay, why? You know, he's like, well, it seems you've had too much to drink. And therefore, a complaint has been lodged and you've been asked to leave. Come along. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm like, well, you want the wine here? I can, I can, you know, here, I'll go get a cup of coffee if you want. Oh, that'd be lovely. I think that's a good idea. Sure. We can do that. We can get you a cup of coffee. Nonetheless, there has been a complaint filed and you've been asked to leave. And I realized, okay, the British have all these rules and they're very polite to you. But then if you cross the rules, you're going right up to the gallows. Yeah. And it's like, here you go. Here's a nice lad. Put the noose on. There's a lot. Off you go. Here we yeah. are. You know? Yeah. And that's I had set the chain in motion. And that's so funny. I had to leave the thing and I was just devastated. I had fucked up the painting. 
I had fucked up my shot at being in front of all these A-listers and done a very mediocre show. And I, everything was wrong. And I was thrown out of Simon Cowell's party. And I never met Simon. And oh, it was just terrible, you know? And so the next day, uh, Cindy wants to go tour around London. And I'm just in a funk. And we go into Westminster Cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, Palm Sunday. I don't know. It's some religious holiday. One of them, Easter. I don't know what it was and something. But uh, they said you can only tour the you can't tour. The tours are closed. But if you want to go to church, you go to church. Well, Cindy's Methodist. So she's like, oh, yeah, let's go to church. I'm like, OK. So I sit there in the church with my iPhone and I wrote out this long letter, long confession in church. Right. To the people that had hired me, you know, the event planners and all this. And I punched sin, and then I felt better. <laughs> and so I went, confessed my sins in the church. And uh, then we went to Piccadilly Circus, saw the 39 steps, and uh, had, a, had a great time in London. Missed the flight home because we took the tube, stayed an extra day after that. Just had a great time. So that's my Simon Cowell story. I, and so now, that sounds anytime terrible you say, because I've, I, I've been thrown out of better places than this, I can use um, that line. Hey, uh, I just got a drawing sent to you just now. Oh, okay. Um, for the uh, potty podcast. The potty podcast. For, for the, the potty podcast. So I'm going to try to, I'm literally just talking to the guy right now. Um, so I'm going to try to show you what just came in. Okay. And it's by Mariam. Um, so let's, let's, one one more real quick, and I'm gonna tell him. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that was one that that picture that that was taken from. I was performing for Oprah, and I thought, oh, big deal! I'm gonna be on Oprah. You know this thing, and she's doing a traveling show. She had come to Houston, and they put us out in a tent in the parking lot, and almost nobody saw the show, and it was super hot, ninety degree weather. And it was, a, it was, a, it, it sounded like, yeah, I'm going to be on Oprah's traveling show. And it's like, you're on main stage. Nah, kind of out in the parking lot. <laughs> nah, there's nobody really here, you know, but so I had looked at the camera and that was my Mike Rowe impression that, that particular face. I'm a big Mike Rowe fan. So I was making my Mike Rowe face. That's funny. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you know, it's funny, the, the, the Simon Cowell thing, cause I was going to ask you earlier um, if you ever tried uh, trying out for America's Got Talent with this. Because... Oh, I got I I didn't make it. Oh, really? Well, here's uh, so, what happened. Yeah, Let's they came hear. to Houston. They came to Houston, and I went, and my agent couldn't come down to keep me out of trouble and keep me from saying the wrong thing. <laughs> and I showed him the video of Ray Charles, and they said, "Yeah, we don't want to make a mess for the rehearsals. So yeah, you're definitely in. You're going to be on. You know, and this is wonderful." So go in this other room. There's cameras around there. They're going to come around and ask you some questions and this and that. And I'm in this big room with a bunch of people and the camera guys are just going around talking to potential interview, you know, to potential people just looking for B-roll and stuff. And they come around and they're asking me questions. And, and at this point, I've already done a lot with my career and I'm kind of full of myself, you know, and they come around and I start going, they say, well, what do you think if you win America's Got Talent? And what they want you to say is, golly gee, Willikers, I sure hope I get it because my dreams would come true, you know? Yeah. And instead, I'm my manager's not there to coach me. And I'm just like, well, you know, I've been around the world and I've painted, uh, you know, Sir Richard Branson and I've done this and I've done that. And, you know, uh, and so this will be a nice little feather in my cap. I'm really looking forward to it. It'll be nice, you know? And I go home and I think everything's all well. And my manager calls me, he goes, what did oh. you say to them? And America's got talent. And I was like, what? I'm going to spend a million dollars on cocaine. I'm like, I'm going to buy all of it. <laughs> yeah. All of the cocaine is going to all be of the mine. Cocaine. Yeah. You yeah, see that, this? I, I won't have two nostrils. I'll have like just one big one. Just one this, big This will be gone. And it's be like. <laughs> uh Anyway, so that he said, he said, well, they said and done you, cocaine. he repeated back to me <laughs> word for word that they said, well, we wanted to hire Dan, but you know, he's been all around the world. He's drawn Richard Branson. He's done this. So I think he's a little too big time yeah. for our show. 
So they passed me over. The next year, David Garibaldi gets on and he goes to second place. And he's worth it. I mean, he's really, really good. Yeah. That guy. I have nothing but respect for David Garibaldi. I'm not trying to slight him at all. He did a phenomenal job and he's a wonderful artist. But uh, but anyway, so that happened. And then uh, and then later I did America's Got Talent. They had a stage show and my manager was producing the America's Got Talent show and doing stuff or, or was working with the people to book things. And I ended up getting hired to do the show and be an audience plant and just say, I've got talent because David didn't want to do the show. And I really regret it now. Looking back on it, I saw it. Oh, here's an opportunity for me to get a credential of being at the Venetian. And, uh, and if David Garibaldi is listening to this right now, I'd like to publicly apologize uh, to him because it ended up being a really shitty thing for me to do. And I should have seen that for what it is. And I should not have gone there and done that. And I mean that from the bottom of the heart, David, if you hear this, because I respect you and you're a wonderful artist. And they ended up firing me for three days after I had moved my studio to Vegas because I wasn't on the show anyway. So mm. uh, it was actually one of the more painful experiences I've been through. And if I had it to do over again, I wouldn't have done it. So there's that for what it's worth if if he ever tunes into that so, podcast. So anything having to do with Simon Cowell is not a good, not good memories, basically. No, 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 <laughs> Simon's all right. Uh, you know, Simon's all right, but but the, the contracts were really scary. Yeah, I mean, you know, they own you in perpetuity throughout the universe, is the way the contract tract is written. Oh, really? And that was part of David's problem, I think, with reading the contracts. It was certainly part of my problem. And I may have acted out um subconsciously so like if you win america's got talent you like you're locked into them for like they get percentage of everything well here's the thing contractually yes in reality they're looking for a music act or they're looking for maybe terry fader in vegas you know the ventriloquist they're looking for things that they can mm -hmm. plug into the standard show business system that they can help a person have a career and take a percentage and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that they're saying yeah. we're going to be your agent right i see okay yeah but, that's what that's what i assumed it was going to be but 99 percent of the time either you don't win or he simon will just look at somebody and say you know i really don't know what to do with you so good luck it's been nice working with you and you're under no obligation at that point but they set the contract up to be that way and i was reading the contract and got freaked out about it but uh, but that's really the thing is, um, you know, it's, it's a weird business, uh, but they can, they have the ability to really give you a solid career. There's, there's nothing uh, wrong with what they're doing. Uh, but I had already had my own career and, and all this. I, and I, I, I'm not against going on America's Got Talent for people to do it. I think, uh, I think it's been a wonderful opportunity for a lot of people. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, it's, uh, my, my manager produces the America's Got Talent traveling stage show that I was in. Now he produces that show or he did until COVID. And, you know, it's a, it's a good show. There's, I, I've got to be very, I, I, I talk too much and I'm not, you know, this is inside show business stuff. Uh, but, uh, they're just people trying to make a living Yeah. at the end of the day, just like, just like an agent, any kind of agent any kind of thing. It's, it's how the business works. Well, can it, the Americans got talent can do great things too, for comics, you know, cause I know like, like my uh, friend Tom Cotter, do you know, Tom? Uh, it sounds familiar, but I'm not sure. Yeah. He, yeah, I, did he win or come in second place one year? I don't think a comics won yet. That's what I was going to say is Josh. He was Blue, second place. He was Josh Blue he, just got he, third he, place. He this lost year. to Olati dogs. He lost to a traveling circus dog act. <laughs> Which was a great dog act. I know them too. They're they're amazing. <laughs> they are. You lost to some dogs. Well, um, yeah, that's got to be a blow, right? But but no, it was. They were. They do a wonderful uh, little show. It's amazing. And they were they were in the show with me it, when I was in a, when I was in the America's Got Talent stage show. I actually learned a lot just from being in it for a few days because they had really professional direction and all this, you know. And, and they were wonderful people to work with. They absolutely were wonderful people. 
just to deal with and stuff. But they have to do, you know, the show was running long and uh, I wasn't on television and they were over budget and they said, we got to cut something. Well, this guy wasn't on TV and we're over budget. Let's cut him. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was just as simple as that. And the reason I apologize to David was because, you know, it's just he didn't want to be in the show. And I kind of jumped on, well, I'll be in the show. It was just kind of a shitty move in retrospect. That's all. Mm. Sometimes we make bad decisions, you know? Yeah. No, I know. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, I, and I'm going through some things now with my life. You know, ever since I had cancer, I'm really looking at my life and trying to get as much right as I can. You know, it's like I, I realize now how finite life is and how short it might be. And I'm healthy. I had bladder cancer. They removed my bladder. I have a neo bladder. Uh, it, they took a part of my intestine, built me a new one, plumbed it through my urethra. So thing, normal function. Um, and I have a very normal life and I expect to live for a long time. Uh, I quit drinking because my doctor said, uh, I said, well, I probably should tell you I'm probably an alcoholic. And he said, those days are over. And he shook my yeah. hand, nice Jewish doctor. And yeah. I needed somebody to do that. Yeah. So it was helpful, you know, mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't really drink. I mean, I might take a sip here and there once in a while. I'm not like an AA guy that's like, Oh my God, I broke my record, you know, or anything yeah. like that. But, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm enjoying sobriety. That's good. Yeah, so, it's good. Yeah. That's why I work out because I get a lot. I mean, I just, just do a little, you know, lift a little weights and walk my dog and stuff like that. But, uh, it, it really helps me be balanced and focused, uh, through the day just to get a little bit of the blood moving in the morning, you know? Yeah, no, that's good. Especially like, like, for, like for me, like I sit all the time, just on oh. deadline, deadline, deadline. So I, I got to try to make myself get out more and do, you know, I try to take my dog for walks and that sort of a thing, but that's a good thing. Walking um, is one of the best yeah. things you can do. I try to, yeah. I try to every day go for good old, good old walk, but, um, the dog, the dog needs it too. The dog, Yeah. He does. Uh, he's the worst though. Oh, what's he do? Oh, uh, he's just, I love my dog, but he's like, um, he's, he's a, he's a boxer. Oh, I used to have a he's, boxer. Uh, yeah, he's the sweetest. Dogs. He's like super nice, sweet dog. Protective but, but, for you. Well, no, he's, he's an idiot. That's the problem. I think, I think no. like, I think he's, got brain damage or something i'm, no, I'm serious no how the, old is this dog he's been this way he's six he's no he's seven okay. um i've had him since he was eight weeks old brain and uh damage. no he is the dumbest dog in the world no like, you just don't oh, understand he, him no 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 i understand really well <laughs> like like he's trying we got i gotta wrap this up and before i go i want to uh just let people know where they can find you um on the socials um okay. and then uh you know paintjam.com uh facebook paint jam uh tiktok let's paint jam uh instagram paint jam all that it's all it's all paint jam paint Everything. jam or if you google dan dunn if you want to just see the video you and i were talking about just google dan dunn jimmy fallon that's the best video yeah, yeah. cool that's so awesome thank you so much for joining me man and uh, everyone check out the links you got to check out the videos they're really cool the jimmy fallon one's awesome uh, I know you're saying bye, so I won't. I won't go into another story. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. It's all good. Um, I I really have to go take a poop. So um, <laughs> it's, been great. it's been great. It's been great talking with you, man. You want answers? <laughs> <laughs>